From 2002 to 2006, J.J. Redick attended Duke, where he was one of the best shooters college basketball has ever seen. He was also one of the most hated players college fans had ever screamed at. And at the University of Maryland, that screaming was particularly loud and vulgar and full of references to his family members. Fans across the nation held deep revulsion for J.J. Redick and had no problem expressing it. Why? What does it take to be the most hated player in college basketball? Not that much, really. Redick had three main factors working against him. First, he went to Duke, an elite private school exclusively for the rich who think they're better than the rest of us. And sure, sure, J.J. Redick didn't actually grow up rich, he's middle class from rural Virginia, but like, what are college students supposed to do? Look up every Duke player's background when it's so much easier and more fun to blindly hate? Plus, by attending Duke, Reddick inherited the role of white Duke villain. In the late 80s, early 90s, it was Christian Leitner who did things like stroke an invisible neckbeard at opposing fans and purposely stomp the chest of Final Four opponent Aminu Timberlake. Then it was Wojo with his obnoxious floor slapping. Next up was J.J. Reddick. It didn't really matter what Reddick's personality actually was, he was white and good at basketball, so he got the part, Duke villain. Which brings me to the second reason everyone hated Reddick. He was really good at basketball. Coach K called him the best peer shooter he'd ever coached. But here's the thing, JJ, nobody likes a winner. It makes the rest of us feel inadequate, and shortly after that, angry. So he went to Duke and was good. That doesn't really seem like he's that bad of a guy, but how about this? He was kind of arrogant. He'd bob his head, talk trash, smirk at the crowd. Here he is waving to the Florida State crowd after hitting a first half buzzer beater. Duke was up by 18. In adulthood, he's even called his college self sort of a prick. And that's all it took. Duke, good, sort of a prick. College basketball fans saw that and said, destroy him. And no school went to greater lengths to destroy him than the University of Maryland. Now, if you didn't go to Maryland, you might not think they had much of a rivalry with Duke, especially because that's the narrative Duke perpetuates. They always chant, not our rivals at Maryland, as if to say Maryland sucks so bad Duke doesn't even think about them. But they did come up with something to chant at Maryland. Just saying, just saying. All right, the Duke-Maryland rivalry is never gonna have the consistency of the Duke-UNC rivalry. Those schools are eight miles apart, have a longer history of b-ball success, and according to the Duke student newspaper, are more competitive academically. Burn on Maryland. But historically, there have been bursts of intense rivalry between the Terps and Blue Devils, and those bursts set the table for our beef. In 1984, UMD ranked 16th, and Duke ranked 14th met in the ACC championship game. Duke fans wore skull caps to mock Maryland coach Lefty Drizel for being bald. Mean, but ineffective. Maryland won and loved being the scrappy underdogs who knocked down the rich private school kids. Sure sounds like there was a rivalry to me. Though I'm now forced to admit that from 1985 to 1994, the Terps beat Duke just once out of 22 games. So fine, no rivalry during that near decade. But how about we fast forward to the early 2000s? Coach Gary Williams had built up Maryland's program and they were direct rivals with Duke. Don't take it from me, take it from Blue Devil Shane Battier. Maryland, for my four years, uh, were, were our, our true rival. Battier's senior year, 2001, the schools met four times. The first would become known as the Miracle Minute Game. Playing at home, the Terps were up 10 with 54 seconds to go and feeling good. Then Jason Williams, who now goes by Jay, scored nine points in 14 seconds. The game went to overtime, where Duke won by two. Incensed, Maryland fans expressed themselves by chucking stuff, water bottles, cups, trash, at the Duke section of the crowd. Not the best idea, because, for example, a water bottle could hit Carlos Boozer's mom in the head, giving her a mild concussion. This incident sticks to Maryland for a while, and even provides Reddick with fuel to hit back at the Terps, but more on that later. Adding insult to injured mother, Maryland won their next matchup by 11. Though Duke got revenge in the ACC semifinals, beating Maryland by two and going on to take the ACC title. The Blue Devils got even more revenge in the final four where they overcame a 22 point deficit to end Maryland's run. 
Hey, UMD, any solace in the fact that Duke went on to win it all? We got beat by the best? No? I get it. At least in 2002, Maryland got their own NCAA championship against Indiana, the team that eliminated Duke in the Sweet 16. Which felt good, certainly, of course, but uh, according to Juan Dixon in this Washington Post documentary, it could have actually felt better. Beating Duke in that championship game would have been much sweeter, you know, because that's what we all were looking forward to. We knew they were on the other side. Uh, we knew we had some classic games in the past. And the following fall, the next Duke villain entered the scene. As a freshman, Reddick developed a reputation as a sharper-than-diamond shooter and was even better the next year. When Reddick arrived in Maryland for their first matchup of his sophomore season, he was the leading scorer on the number one team in the nation. Maryland was unranked. But standings be damned, the Maryland students looked at the pieces, Duke, good, cocky, rivalry, and chose to beat. Students used the weapons at their disposal, t-shirt slogans were antagonistic, if not a bit long-winded. Signs were a bit more straightforward, got him. Though some signs went uncomfortably far, referencing sexual acts with his then 12-year-old sister, which I think we can all agree is just horrid. Reddick responded by simply playing so well. He went five of six from three, and after each shot, he treated fans to some signature grinning and head bobbing. Reddick even talked a little trash with the Baltimore Ravens owner sitting courtside. With 18 and a half seconds left, Reddick had a chance to put the game out of reach with two free throws. He made the first. Then, Maryland hit him with a chant that wasn't exactly clever, but was certainly aggressive. It's the 63-60, but then a turnover and two missed shots, and then the two fouls against Riddick. JJ flashed him a smile before hitting the next shot. Maryland lost 68-60, and the university as a whole got some pretty bad press. You see, the game was broadcast nationally on ESPN, so there was no time to censor that chant. And apparently, even avoiding some of the more profane t-shirts was difficult. From USA Today to ESPN's Outside the Lines, Maryland was painted as what's wrong with college fandom. UMD's administration made efforts to repair their image and even reached out to the state's attorney general's office to figure out how to ban cursing without violating freedom of speech. They decided it was a little too complicated to prohibit cursing, and instead held t-shirt exchanges, started a student sportsmanship committee, and forbid the pep band from playing Rock and Roll Part 2, a song which Terp fans had made their own, adding a refrain of, Hey, you suck, directed at opposing teams. The chastised Maryland fan base wouldn't see Reddick and College Park until next season, but they found ways to keep the beef warm until then. They got his phone number and called him at all hours of the night, which, hey, other schools did too. Maryland just did it in a larger capacity, and perhaps with more vitriol. All the hostility started to get to Reddick, but there's a chance those negative feelings were exacerbated by a late-season shooting slump. The Terps even beat the Blue Devils for the ACC title in large part because of that shooting slump. Reddick found renewed focus in the summer between his sophomore and junior year. He got in superhero shape and became not just a great shooter, but a better all-around player. And on February 12, 2005, J.J. Reddick finally returned to College Park, Maryland for a rematch with the Terrapin student section. Before the game, ESPN College Game Day aired a segment meant to drum up sympathy for poor maligned J.J. Reddick discussed the animosity he faced on the road. I'm amazed at some of the things that come out of you know, college students' mouths directed towards me. And singled Maryland out. I think the worst episode um, was definitely at Maryland last year. He brought up the signs about his little sister as a particular sticking point, which, yeah, that's fair. Somebody had made a sign saying that they had had sex with her, uh, which I thought was, was pretty gross, pretty sick and twisted. And then the segment got weird. Sitting in a darkened gym, Reddick read from his journal. If it was simply journal entries, that would be embarrassing enough. But it wasn't just journal entries. It was his poetry. November 5th, 2005. I can't see what my future has in store, but I move forth with the strength of a condor, the courage of a warrior. I mean, what was ESPN thinking? People already hate the kid, why pour blood in the water? As far as Maryland was concerned, this College Game Day special did not soften their hearts towards J.J. Reddick. In fact, it kind of made them resent him more. Like, okay, sure, J.J. gets hate on the road, but so does everyone, including Maryland players. 
DJ Strawberry endured taunts about his father Daryl Strawberry's private life. And how about Juan Dixon? UVA fans chanted crackhead parents at him. Dixon's parents struggled with drug addiction, contracted HIV from needles, and both died when Dixon was a young teen. But he didn't get a soft light college game day special about how he dealt with fans. So why'd JJ get one? Cause he's a clean cut white kid who goes to Duke? Kinda seemed that way. Despite the injustice, the UMD administration wasn't trying to have another incident. Before the game, Gary Williams asked students to behave and security even checked signs at the door. While most signs were a-okay, some profane ones slipped through, including ones that showed learnings from Reddick's College Game Day episode. See, this one hits both his poetry and the understandable fact he doesn't like when fans say gross things about his family. Jeannie and Abby are his older and younger sisters, respectively. But despite the few outliers, Maryland fans overall managed to walk the fine line between enthusiasm and being just horrid. They booed every time Reddick touched the ball and turned Duke's Not Our Rival chant back on them. Duke lost in OT and JJ didn't have a great game. He even airballed the three. What a treat for Maryland. In his senior year, Reddick kept the beef sizzling, but just completely outplaying us. I mean, Maryland. Ooh, ooh, bias slipped out a bit there. He scored 27 points in a blowout home win, and in his final Maryland matchup, Reddick had 35 points in another large win. Interviewed after that game, he presented himself as above any Maryland beef with a quote that seemed innocent enough, but wasn't. The first part of this quote is playing into the time-honored, not our rival, we don't care about Maryland tradition. And the second part? That's a full-on reference to the Carlos Boozer mom incident. Reddick might as well have said, remember the worst thing these bad kids have ever done? Don't let them off the hook for that. And while JJ was fanning the flames, this beef had an expiration date. Most college beef does. Reddick graduated in 2006 and was drafted 11th overall by the Magic. And within four or possibly five years of that, the Maryland students who'd hated him live and in person had graduated too. But hey, expired beef can have a pretty strong scent. Years into his pro career, Reddick was still booed when he played the Wizards in DC. And Reddick struck back when asked about the boos, he played the not our rival card. But as time wore on and JJ started to be known as more than just a Duke star, the beef didn't stink as bad. Sure, Maryland alumni of a certain era still harbor some ill will toward the guy. And sure, Reddick isn't going to totally put his time at Duke behind him, even if he wants to, as he said in 2020 on his podcast. It's weird to be 36 and still get asked about Duke. College beef is a unique cut. There doesn't have to be much substance to create rich, bold flavors that fill you up and stick to your bones well after the meal is over.